Welcome to a community conversation about the proposed Lake Powell Pipeline. The purpose of our community conversations is to encourage our Washington County neighbors to participate in building and shaping a community that supports all of us by sharing their ideas. My name is Jennifer Kohler. I teach here at Dixie State University in the Communication Department. Our live broadcast today from the Community Education Channel at Dixie State University is open to the public and includes residents of Washington County, among them Douglas Alder and Richard Kohler. I'm going to keep our introductions very short and ask our viewers if you would, or our audience members if you would like more information about Doug or Richard or any of the information that we share tonight or comments that are made to please go to our Facebook page. We've set up a dedicated Facebook page and you should see that, that URL show up on your screens occasionally during the program so that you'll know how to go to that Facebook page. We consider this conversation tonight just a very small piece of a very big conversation. Uh, <clears throat> we're hoping that our broadcasts, our community conversations, will stimulate community participation in local decision making and that our Facebook page will facilitate that input. I've involved and invited Doug and Richard as feature guests today because of our mutual interest in the pipeline issue and in local history here in Washington County. Utah, and it just occurred to me while you two were talking that it's also great that you're friends with each other and you trust each other and respect each other. Because when we're having a conversation, isn't it a lot easier to figure things out when you trust the people and respect the people that you're talking with? So I'm really glad that I didn't think about that dynamic until I saw you two talking a second ago. But um, the three of us have actually spent some time already discussing the, the pipeline, and I also, because they're clear thinkers, and they both have valuable information and points of view to contribute to the conversation, I want to tell you about our format. What we're going to do is have a brief introduction to some information. It's not comprehensive about the pipeline by any means, but we want to introduce some ideas, some research, and some points of view in the first segment and then partway into the second. And then we want you guys to drive the conversation with your comments, uh, your questions, and maybe you'll have some answers for us as well. And uh, we, uh, one thing I'm not interested in or I didn't design into the event was a pro and con. I had people say to me, well, who's going to be, which one's in favor and which one's against? I'm really not interested in the debate idea so much as two people who care very much and are smart people sharing the information they have and their perspectives. And so what we're going to do the next two hour is we, next hour is we really hope the conversation will highlight the complexity and the nuances about this most important conversation about water in the arid west. So I'm going to start by asking Doug, uh, you were a president of this uh, institution when it was a college in the 1980s. You, in my mind, um, are an ideal person to be talking about it because I think you have a lot of credibility and you're well known in the community and you're a busy guy. Just tracking you down for tonight was no small <laughs> challenge. So let me ask you, busy as you are, why do you think that even having this conversation is worth, is worth having? Well, as you know, I have studied the history of this area for about 25 years and written a lot about it. And as I said to you on the phone, I think this question is the most significant question in the entire history of the county. And there have been some very important questions. Can you remember the Washington Fields Dam? That was a crucial thing that those people kept at it and finally got it 17 times. And the Enterprise Reservoir, oh, do you know the story of Huntsman and how long and how hard, and they finally got it. And did it make a difference? Okay, anybody ever heard of the Hurricane Canal? Man, alive, fantastic things that have happened in our past. Now we face this question. Now, why do I think this question is so important? Whether we like it or not, the statistics from the governor's office are pretty trustable. If you look back 
they have been pretty well on target and they're telling us that we're going to get to 300,000 for sure and probably more. That's double. 300 is about double, right? Right. Okay. And, uh, and that's within what, 15, 18 years? Okay. And, uh, and that it will be going. Now, I had an experience when I first got here. The, the city had a proposal to limit growth. And the St. George Magazine came to me and said, would you write about that? And I said, yes, I'll write nine reasons for and nine reasons against. And, and you can tell that's what a professor does. Okay, so I went to see the most important economist in the state, and he said, Douglas, you can't limit growth. You are a city. You are part of a county. You are part of a state and you're part of the nation. And anyone who is a citizen in the United States can move to St. George and you can't stop them. Uh, we cannot pass laws that build a fence around the Mexican border, okay? <laughs> so, uh, people will come. Now, they may not come if the hookup charges are $175,000. I, I don't know about that. But I think the growth projections are fairly solid. All right. Secondly, uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about the hookup charge idea. As I understand it, I've never sat down with uh, Thompson and, and talked, but as I read, uh, I get the idea that the basic way of paying for this is going to be a great increase in hookup charges. And other places have done some things like that. Uh, but uh, I don't see how the citizens will put up with that. Now, we have a problem in this county. I hope you know this. I assign you to go home and read your water bill. It is <laughs> disgusting. My water bill is $25 a month. Do you have any idea what the water bill is in Phoenix or Tucson or, or Vegas? Uh, you know, to tell people that the hookup charges are going from, well, of course, they've already gone up, but if they're going to go way up like that, I don't think there's anybody here that could pay $175,000 for a, a hookup <laughs> charge. Okay, Mr. <laughs> my, my boss is sitting right up there. Okay, so, pro. Uh, the growth is going to happen. The hookup charges are going to go up, but I seriously doubt that they can pay for it. We cannot limit growth. Now, everyone in this room, <laughs> some of you haven't lived here the whole time, would all of you who, were, who publicly opposed Sand Hollow please raise your hands? Okay. Those of you who publicly opposed Quail Creek, would you raise your hands? I don't know how long ago. Cox, can you tell us when was the water district uh, organized? 1955. 1965. 55. 55. What they have done since that time is about 12 major water projects, and I hope you all know that they've now linked them all together. So Doug, can I interject for a second? Yeah. Then? So what I, I want to, to for you, can I have you hold that where you are in your notes for a second? Right, I'm right there. Okay, yeah, keep your thumb on it. So what we, what we want to do is we want to kind of kick off the conversation and then let people know what we can come back to. So if, if we could have Dick show us in just a minute some yes. graphics. And some of those graphics, you're looking at them, so you know right. what he's going to well, show. Well, let me give you one more on Pro, okay. and then I'll turn it over to, okay. to him. As you know, there is a political reality. Was it 1922 when the compact was done? 22. All right. So the compact was set up so that the bottom three uh, states got half of the water, and the top four states got the other half the water. Is that correct? Yep. All right. Now, have you done any population analysis of those states? So the upper four have half of the water, 
and we aren't using it all, and California is using our water. Do you think there's any possibility that the 40 million people in California can convince this nation to redraw the, the compact? <laughs> They're practically a well, country all the by Well, the proponents yeah. <laughs> uh, of the pipeline said, we better get our part of the, of the water coming into Utah so that we can negotiate rather than already have our part gone. That's a good, that's a good place to pause for a minute, okay. I'm thinking. So I just want to mention before I t uh, it, have Dick launch off on some graphics that he's invited partly because he's my husband and in spite of the fact he's my husband. And because he's written two very important books he has. on this area. <laughs> yes, because he has an engineer's brain and he loves hard data and he has a way he can process it. And also because uh, we had a lot of conversations about it. And, and I'm saying he's in, invited in spite of the fact he's my husband because sometimes our conversations get kind of messy and frustrating. So I'm letting That's you know. That's the definition of this whole argument. Yes, it, it is true. <laughs> but just in case you see me do something, you know, like, you know, kick him from here or throw something, you'll know that you know, we've agreed in advance that that's acceptable if, if he goes way <laughs> off script, okay? So what he, he's been doing a lot of research. So he wanted to show some graphics, and then we'll take a break, come back to the graphics, and then we're going to have you drive the conversation with your comments and questions for Doug and for Dick. Does that sound good? Okay. So, Dick, you've got to know you can look up here on the monitor, and he's just going to briefly, very briefly go through... Uh, five or six of these graphics and we'll take a break and then come back and then know that we can come back to these because these are you know they have a lot of information on them and we'll just kind of show them to get it started okay <laughs> the first image here is a waterfall map of the entire United States and uh, the land west of the 100th meridian is pretty much not green it isn't exactly a straight line but you can see the east and the west the land to the west in the mid-19th century was called the Great American Desert uh, <clears throat> it, because it received less than 30 inches of rainfall. The beginning of the green is 30 inches, so it's a good map to look at that. Um, too little, that was too little and is too little to grow food. Um, the Mormons colonized a large portion of this desert land by diverting mountain streams, building storage reservoirs, canals and ditches and made it blossom like a rose. Let's go to the next image. This is an image of Washington County in 1903, and it was uh, made up, the supervisor of the map making was Elwood Mead, person that uh, Mead, uh, Lake Mead is named for. Um, it shows numerous canals that had been completed by 1903 to deliver water to thirsty farmland in green and communities mostly in red, <coughs> in reddish brown. <coughs> Many of the canals were longer than eight miles, and they had been com completed, like Doug says, the Hurricane Canal, through extremely difficult terrain with only horse and manpower, no machines, uh, per se. The success of Mormon colonization, uh, which reclaimed the arid desert lands for settlement, was recognized by the United States government officials, including um, Elwood Mead and John Wesley Powell, uh, who Lake Powell is named after. During the 1890s, John Wesley Powell completed topographic maps, which were used to identify discrete drainage basins and sites for potential water storage reservoirs. The Mormon formula, keep the commandments, pay tithing, pray for rain, doesn't work without ditches. Um, <clears throat> the Mormons pioneering efforts in water development eventually led to the formation of the United States Bureau of Reclamation, um, <clears throat> making, uh, which built bigger water projects that further transformed the great American desert, uh, making today's metropolitan areas in Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Arizona possible. Now my third image, uh, about two years ago, now a little, uh, 19, end of 2014, Citizens for Dickie's, Dixie's Future invited uh, Tom Ash, a water efficiency expert who had helped put in place some tiered water rates, often called conservation pricing, 
for the Irvine Ranch Water District in Southern California. Center of that's Irvine, California. Um, uh, they invited to come here and speak at the Entrada Clubhouse. This graph shows the reduction in landscape water use of about 24%. It's the purple line, the magenta line, that was accomplished um, by not just the additional costs and the tiers, but the district sent out customized bills that told people whether they were water savers, average water users, or water abusers. And that psychology also, I think, contributed to the, the savings. Uh, it was accomplished by 1998. But the graph also reveals that after 1998, and you'll notice the magenta line kind of rebounds a little bit, um, well, no more water savings were possible. And it stayed that way pretty much until 2013, kind of the middle of California's most recent drought. Uh, it wanted, at the end of that presentation, I talked to Tom Ash. We went online. And um, this, the next image, if you will, um, there's this uh, tabulation of the water delivered. And they, Irvine Water Ranch said they, they delivered 93,000 acre feet to their customers in 2013. And they served a population of 370,000 people. So when you do the math and you get the days and the gallons worked out, it comes out to 225 gallons per capita per day. There, there is an asterisk, though, by the population served, because that isn't the census population. The census population is smaller than that number. And if you divide it by the census, the uh, actual gallons per capita day would go up to above 250 gallons. It's hard to know the exact number. Um, and during, what's ours? And during the same year, 2013, in Washington County, our water use was reported at 283 gallons per capita per day. And it counts the same total sources, so those two numbers are comparable, the, around 250 and the 283. Many people are telling uh, people in Washington County that we're really bad water abusers. We don't know how to use our water. We haven't instituted the conservation pricing. We haven't done some things that we will do. But for now, we're not as bad for where we are, where, as people often depict us in Washington County. That's the purpose of that dash. Now, this next graph is a comparison of tiered water rates that uh, was published about a year ago in a legislative audit uh, report in May of last year. Note that St. George, is down on the bottom of the graph, is, does have tiered water pricing. Um, Washington County Water Conservancy District adopted a policy in support of uh, conservation or tiered pricing in 2010. Uh, this last year, in 2015, the district had added a policy supporting the customized billing statements that would be modeled after Irvine Ranch. Presently, St. George charges about $1.28 per thousand gallons. Question I want to ask the audience, and I've asked myself, would a penny per gallon be too much to charge for water, pure water, delivered to your house? That's about eight times more, but really, for if you look at what Irvine Ranch, Park City, other places charge. I don't think we, I think we can afford that. Now the, the next graph is um, the, how people pay for the water, presently, how the districts in throughout Utah, the water districts, finance uh, their water. And if you look at ours, uh, it's about a third, a third, a third. And locally, again, this was published in the legislative auditors, auditors report about a year ago. Uh, Elected and appointed officials here think that property tax, a third, uh, user fees, rates that you pay, a third, and then impact fees, another third, is an equitable way to, in the future, do water. That so can that, change. That harkens back to Doug's comment about just the hookup fees yeah. carrying the burden, and this model divides it into thirds, roughly. Yeah, now okay. in Park City, which is the second graph on the bar, it's really Snyderville Basin, the rural part of Park City. They rely, 85% of their fees come from user fees, uh, the rates you pay. And if you look on another chance, uh, Duchesne County, it's about, um, let's see, almost 90% of their rate is paid for by property taxes. So different districts have different uh, philosophies. And like I say, ours is that, that pretty, that looking for that balance of a third, a third, a third from the different sources. Uh, uh, this, is, this might be a good uh, graphic to stop, stop on and then yeah. just go for a short break. 
and then we'll come back in just a minute and talk some more about some of the research that's being done, some of the statistics that are available. Now, I know you can't read these graphs from where you are, so I want you to know that we're going to post all this information on our Facebook page. So you can just click on there, and the idea is we want to create a portal. I spent uh, about an hour and a half, almost two hours with Lisa Rutherford and recorded our conversation. She had a lot of uh, references and sources that she relies on, and I'm going to put that information on the Facebook page as well. So we want to create a page where you can go to for information. So come back in just a few minutes and join us for the next segment of this community conversation about the Lake Powell Pipeline. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. And as soon as I start to make my breakfast, Hamilton is right there. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. I mean, look at this little face. I do not love him. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Getting that college education. What are you going to do? Graduate and take some office job? Be like everybody else. Or will you dare do something different? Like be a teacher. You could be my teacher. You got the skills. The smarts. Yes, you. You could be the teacher I never forget. That would be cool. Does that corporate job even have recess? What are you going to make of yourself? What are you going to make of me? Welcome back to our community conversation about the proposed Lake Powell Pipeline. Let's look at a few more graphics related to the pipeline and then we'll turn our time over to our studio guests for questions and comments and some answers possibly as well. So Richard, okay, uh, show us a few more of these uh, graphics that you prepared. I don't know what the next one's up, but okay. uh, this is an image, yeah, here it is. This is an image of the uh, a couple of projects. The first question I think we should answer about Lake Powell Pipeline is, is the $1 billion cost estimate for Lake Powell Pipeline prepared in 2008 credible? And uh, I have two projects that I've uh, selected. One's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it transfers water out of the upper basin, that San Juan, to the Albuquerque and Santa Fe areas. It, by, they literally dug a tunnel underneath the Continental Divide. That uh, project cost $500 million. Um, it delivers 46,000 acre feet of water. Uh, before they had that, they were actually mining their aquifers, causing uh, uh, subsidence and cracks in the land and other environmental problems. Um, they, uh, the cost, the 2008 cost, that project was complete in 2008 was $11,000 per acre foot. Um, the other one that I, is down the lower left-hand corner of this picture is, was just completed this last fall in uh, Carlsbad, California, where they built a $1 billion desalination plant that will deliver on average 70,000 acre feet per year to their to San Diego County Water District. Uh, that's a cost of just over $14,000 per acre foot. These two projects that have been completed recently are the reason that I believe that the 2014 estimate for the Lake Powell Pipeline uh, cost, when you take that cost, just under a billion dollars because uh, Iron County dropped out of 912 billion, uh, is a cost of almost $11,000 per acre foot, which is right in line with these two recently you completed You mean to say projects. 912 million? 912 million dollars. That's right in line with the $11,000 per acre foot cost for that. It's right in line with these two. So I believe that it is, in fact, a reliable cost estimate, an accurate one. Uh, my next one is, the, we have to answer the question, is the $1 billion price tag for Lake Powell affordable? Can we afford to pay that $1 billion as a community? And to do that, what we want to do is look at our recent, a little bit of recent math history in uh, our community. In 1983, these graphs show the upper one is that, that uh, when we did Quail Creek Dam in 1983, the project cost was $30 million. 
the taxable assessment of the entire real estate in all the county was just over a hundred million dollars, 101 million dollars. So the cost of the project was about 30 percent for that general obligation bond of the taxable value of the county. In 2014, the value for, for the Lake Powell Pipeline project was estimated at that time at 912 million. And with a 2014 property tax assessment of over 11 billion. So that's 8% of the, the project cost is 8% of the taxable value. So my conclusion is that we would be much less, we'd be making much less of a sacrifice now to do the Lake Powell project than we did in 1983 to complete the Quail Creek Reservoir. If your data is correct. That's true. If my, if my million dollar, a billion dollar estimate's correct. I now, don't think it is. <laughs> uh, now, the next question that comes up, and we have to answer as well, is, is the Colorado River a reliable source, water source? And we need to also ask, which people do not do, is the Virgin River a reliable source? This is a graph that many people are familiar with. Uh, it's the history, and it goes back, Doug pointed out, to 1919. 19, 1928 at least is on there. That's when they built uh, or began building uh, Boulder Dam in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, they, there's, this is the historical, the blue line is the historical water supply and the red line is the historical water use. 2008 is a key year because that's the year that the, we actually used for the first time all the water that's in the Colorado and maybe even a little bit more uh, uh, than we, sh than we was really there to use. Um, and then they project into the future, what will we do? Well, to answer that graph, this graph was prepared by the Bureau of Reclamation. This was not a big surprise to the water managers of the Colorado River. As early as 2001, the Secretary of the Interior officially informed California that by 2016, that's this year, it would need to implement water conservation programs to reduce its use of the four, it's reduced to the 4.4 million acre feet that it's allotted, where it had been using uh, 800,000 acre feet more than the 1922 Colorado conflict allowed. Secretary of Interior, you have to stop that and you have to stop it and complete it by 2016. Most of the water districts in California have complied and had complied as of last summer, not all. Um, in 2007, the Secretary made some additional uh, requirements, not of California, but of Nevada and Arizona. Uh, and how he did that is he set um, guidelines, interim guidelines, based on the Lake Powell elevation uh, above 1,075 feet both states were entitled to their entire obligation, 300,000 acre feet for Nevada, Southern Nevada and um, 2.8 million acre feet for Arizona. Those go down each incrementally uh, down to the lowest level, which triggers <laughs> the biggest reduction that both Arizona and uh, Nevada have to do. Uh, below, so below 1,025 feet, Nevada has to be limited to only 280,000 acre feet and uh, Arizona to only 2.32 million acre feet. Now, they can't use their whole allotment. That reduces their share by 500,000 acre feet that they can take legally, and that with the 800,000 acre feet that California can't take that they were taking, reduces the demand on the Colorado River by 1.3 million acre feet, uh, according to his guidelines. Now, we always talk about that, the Colorado, but let's talk about the Virgin, because the climate change will affect the Colorado River Basin, and it may not be able to deliver the 15 million acre feet it always has, uh, but the Virgin might also not be able to deliver what it always has. Southern Nevada Water Authority, that's the Las Vegas area, claimed water rights to the Virgin in 1989 and 1983, and they claimed uh, 183,000 acre feet of water rights. The whole flow of the Virgin River annually was only 170,000 acre feet on average. So they claim more than the river flows. The Secretary of the Interior again in 2007 addressed that unresolved claim in his uh, interim guidelines by stipulating that SNWA would not seek to divert water rights from the Virgin prior to 2014 
and that SNWA in Nevada would not refile any claim or uh, application without consulting other basin states. These stipulations made by the Secretary of the Interior should remind us that the Virgin River is a part of the lower basin and consequently subject to future negotiation among basin states regarding water availability in times of shortage. The greatest overlooked benefit of the Lake Powell pipeline is that additional water supply security is achieved by having sources in both the upper and lower basins. Um, the graphic here that I've been talking about, and you heard the numbers, the 1,075 and the 1,025 triggers for conservation, mandatory conversa conversation. You'll notice that the lowest intake has, that, was, that was built just finished last year at a cost of 817 million, not quite a billion, uh, is pla was placed by Southern Nevada water users at 860 feet, well below the trigger elevations, but also below the 900 foot dead pool. A dead pool is when you no longer release water out of the reservoir. So Southern Nevada is planning on something. So we maybe should all be prepared. Uh, my next uh, illustrations here, and I'll just go quickly through these. There are some water conservation strategies that the water district examined that just aren't, that are just, can be very expensive. Um, Landscape water rebates. In Las Vegas, uh, $2 a square foot is offered by the Southern Nevada Water Users Authority for every square foot of grass that you'll take out and replace with desert landscaping. In California, uh, Southern California, San Diego, you can get $2 from the Metropolitan Water, and on top of that, a total of $3.50 per each square foot to do the same thing. Um, those costs uh, in San Diego and, and in, in Las Vegas end up when you do the math. The, uh, just the cost that is given to the owner of the house per acre foot of water saved is $66,000 per acre foot for the $2 a square foot rebate in Las Vegas. And the rebates in California are $184,000. Now in part, that's because when you save water, both districts conducted studies and said you could only save 30% the new desert landscaping compared to the prior lawn landscaping in Las Vegas. And in California, it's only 18% for a residential customer. We often think of those as being 100% of the water gone, and that's just not true. Those costs of 66,000 an acre foot and 184,000 acre foot should be compared to the pipeline at under $11,000 an acre foot. Now, the other thing that's bad about landscape replacement is it triggers something else. So I'll go to the next slide. This is a 114 year temperature history of St. George, but it's different than most you see. You usually see the green line in the middle, the average annual temperature and how it's changed. This is separated into a yellow line on top, the average annual high temperature, and the blue line, the average annual low temperature. And you'll notice that the yellow line on top is pretty much exactly in a straight line like it's always been. If, it had, if we were subject to global warming, that would have bent and gone up. But what we're in fact doing, and it's labeled urban heat island effect, is pronounced since the, say, 1979 graphically. And we've, we've had nighttime temperatures increase in St. George by at least 10, maybe 12 degrees Fahrenheit since the, say, 1979. So that's the signature of an urban heat island effect. And that's caused by deletion of vegetation. It's caused by more streets, more asphalt, more paving, air conditioning, vehicle exhaust, a lot of things. But cumulatively, what it does is there's more hours each day for an air conditioner to run. There's more evaporation from plants, trees, and crops because of that 10 degree Fahrenheit difference. Water conservation strategies should be selected which do not have an adverse impact on ambient air temperatures and the urban heat island effect. It's actually crucial for our district to recognize that. My last, my last image is one where <clears throat> we dim this was done at ASU in 2013, Arizona State University. They measured the temperature difference between a traditional, they call it mesic landscape on the left, and a xeric landscape on the right uh, at North Desert Village in Mesa, Arizona. They concluded that the afternoon peak temperatures were increased by three degrees Fahrenheit over a four hour period 
at a height of two meters or six foot seven inches above the ground. Um, that three degree Fahrenheit temperature increase was estimated to increase electric, the electricity needed for air conditioning by 12 to 24 percent, depending on the efficiency of the air conditioning equipment. Such an increase might increase electric utility bills by a larger amount if peak period electric surcharges exist. In, in uh, California, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, peak rates jump to almost 36 cents a kilowatt hour from a base rate of 20 cents. Not quite double, but that when you add on top, your bill might not go up by 24%, it might go up by almost 50%. Um, now, according to a professor at Virginia Tech, uh, Professor Yunos, it takes an average of 25 gallons uh, to produce one, ca uh, one kilowatt hour of electricity from the grid, and probably that's mostly a thermal electric generated power. Uh, if, if, a ca if a regular customer has a regular size house, average size house, purchases about 700 kilowatt hours per month, that three degree temperature increase translates into additional 150 kilowatt hours, um, requiring the use of 3,600 gallons of water per month, or 120 gallons per day, per household. If you figure there are two and a half people on average in a household, you're gonna add 48 gallons per capita per day. Now, why that matters is our per capita per day water use in St. George is 55, and the threshold we think we can get to in the near is future is Is that for the 50. indoor? That's for indoor water use right. only. And if this power, what the, 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 uh, the heat that we increase, if that water costs were attributed, which it's not, if it were counted, we'd almost double the indoor water use. And again, that tells us that the small temperature difference it can have a big impact and that our water conservation policy should be examined for their impact on energy use, particularly peak energy use. In the Lake Powell Pipeline project, they did examine some alternatives. One is a pump storage. At the bottom of the hurricane cliff, they collect water, they pump it uphill off peak. When the low, rates are low, they let the water run downhill to generate peak power. So that <laughs> when we power the pipeline pumps, we don't make it necessary to build a new power plant, not here, but somewhere else. And it's one of the environmental benefits of the present plan that really hasn't been discussed at all. I'd like to end my presentation okay, there thanks. today. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're, we're gonna dispense with our second break so that we don't throw that minute away. And we have about 20 minutes left. And remember, don't despair. This is just a small part of the big conversation. It's not gonna end here. We're gonna amplify it by way of Facebook and, and other ways. But please, if you would like to refute some statistics or ask for a little more detail on, a, on some of the information or offer a, a question that's just really been bugging you about this project, please just stand up and then Doug uh, Caputo, our producer, will walk around with a mic. And if you just inter introduce yourself so we know who you are, and if you want to make a contribution, we would love it this next 20 minutes. I so. want to call on Brooks. You want to call what on? What do you think about this $1 million cost that this guy is telling us? $1 about? billion. $1 billion cost. I think I could spend 20 minutes refuting just about everything uh, Mr. Kohler had to say. Uh, but since you've called on me, what I was going to call on you to go to your con list. You gave the pros, and Mr. Kohler gave 20 minutes of pros, and we didn't get to your cons. But I know some of them. Should I hit a few? I mean, look, does anybody doubt about this, the statement that at least it's uncertain whether this pipeline will be built? At least it's uncertain. We're not sure. There's a lot of questions. The amount of water, whether it'll be in the Colorado River, whether the lower basin with 65 congressmen versus the upper basin, 12 or whatever it is, if the compact got reopened and discussed, and, you know, we, the deck is stacked against us. And, and there's also a lot of people, and it's growing, who maybe don't want the pipeline because of the cost, which is probably closer to three. They're estimating two to three now. So, you know, you've got seven or eight year old numbers, Mr. Kohler, but uh, whatever it is, it's a lot of money. And if we get stuck with it and we don't grow because the impact fees are so high, then it's a serious lot of money. And what I'm saying, because I've got a lot to say about the pipeline, since 1998 I've been protesting this pipeline. And mainly 
for the reason of growth. I don't think this county should have 600,000 people. Look at Bluff Street right now. We have enough water to double. We don't need the pipeline. We can double. Yes, the Virgin River is susceptible. There's a lot of aquifers, conservation, a lot of things we can do. Uh, you know, 60% of the Virgin River flow goes to agriculture. And about 90% of agriculture is growing alfalfa. Couldn't be less efficient. So, you know, there's a lot of water in Enterprise and up the state, a lot closer than 140 miles to Lake Powell, and a lot of it flowing downhill where it wouldn't have to be pumped, and it would be way less than the 11 to $30,000 an acre foot. Uh, what has to happen? Elected officials, and want to be elected officials, and at least Gill and Dean show up at a, a meeting like this. I was kind of expecting the county commission and the mayors around the county to come and listen to what some of the population have to say. Uh, they need to plan for the possibility that it is not built. Where would we be if we counted on this pipeline, 2020 comes, we're 280,000 people or whatever the number is then, and we're counting on the pipeline and all of a sudden the drought persists, the costs go up, the lower basin says no, uh, all those things happen, then we've got a problem. Right now at 160,000 people in this county, we can grow to double, nobody's getting cut off at the knees, with the local available water. And we could still have some lawns. Yes, we would all have to conserve. Yes, some alfalfa agriculture may have to go out, various things that we would have to do. Uh, but the county commission should instigate a program, since you two gentlemen are uh, vying for posts there, uh, to insist, you know, I think it was the county commission that inspired the gen all the cities to do general plans and things like that about 15 years ago. I think they need to do a general plan based on the possibility that we have to cut off growth at 300 or 325, 350,000 people and plan for it now. So if it starts looking like the pipeline can't happen, we're ready to actually react and do the right thing. If we get to 350, then the pipeline doesn't happen. Then we're like these places Mr. Kohler was talking about that have to build tunnels under the Great Divide in San Diego. See, these places got so big, they had to spend huge money just to solve the problem of what was already there. We have the option today, right now today, to plan. And it wouldn't take much. It would take very low density out in the outlying areas like Dameron Valley, upriver, Winchell, all those areas that are low density anyway, like one lot per two acres, get closer to the city, one acre lots, get into the center core, quarter acre lots, and certainly some high rises and things like that, four and five story apartment blocks and things like that that are coming to the town anyway. Uh, the county commission would instruct that we, we may not have to limit it to this, but what if we only had another 150,000 uh, people we could allow, which is about another 50,000 homes, divvy up those building permits from you know, anybody in the pooling agreement. You don't need to mess with Springdale, you don't need to mess with Dameron Valley and Pine Valley and Enterprise, they're all on their own water systems. But those that are in the pooling agreement, paying the huge impact fees and how that's ever gonna get washed out if the pipeline doesn't be built, these people that have paid a, you know, six to eight to 35,000 and going up, impact fees on the water, how that'll ever be made right uh, is a big question. But they, the cities need to plan for the day when maybe the pipeline is out of the question and we have to stop growth. Because, Doug, you can stop growth. It just stops itself. When the land is gone or the water is gone, it stops. So you can spend big money to do something about it then, but it would be a lot more money. So I got a lot I could say about the pipeline. I really think it is a bad idea. I have since 1998. I do appreciate what the water district has done. And nobody was against Quail Creek, nobody was against Sand Hollow, nobody was against 100 years ago, the, you didn't mention the cotton, that's the line I always Wood think canal. about, the Cottonwood Pipeline, built out of wood, an eight inch line, built out of wood, 35 miles from the Cottonwood Spring. It flowed downhill, so there was no pumping. But the city lived on that beautiful, <laughs> you know, wonderful water until finally the age of electricity and pumping it out of the ground saved our bacon. But uh, yeah, we've done, under you know the crises built dams built great water projects over the years and i applaud them all and i applaud ron thompson and the way he's run that district for those projects i just think right now we need to at least accept the possibility that it may not happen 
Oh, Brooks. And plan for it. Brooks, I, I wanted to ask you, you when you first stood up, you said that you felt like you could counter a lot of this information that, that Richard presented. Would you be willing, if we put it on that Facebook page, to just comment specifically on where you think there's errors or misinterpretations of data so that we can kind of burrow, you know, bore down a little bit yeah. below the surface. I, that would sure. be, that would add a lot, I think, to the... I'm not on Facebook, but some, I'll find a friend that is. Okay, all right, that would be great, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Doug, there's somebody over, two people over here. Okay, let me just ask everyone, uh, because of lighting purposes, to uh, remain in their seat when they ask the question or start the discussion. Was that you, hey, What do you want Slava? from me? Who raised their hand up here? I did. Did you have a question? Yes. Okay. Uh, my okay. name is Slava Lubomudrov. I live in uh, Ivan's, Utah. And my question is very to the point and blunt. Has decision, the decision already been made? And is this really pointless? That, you know, that is one of the three questions I had. Is this inevitable? Are we just wasting our time having a conversation about it? <clears throat> so I appreciate that you asked that question. So we've heard from Doug and Dick. Is there a Richard? Is there anybody who else has an opinion on if this is inevitable? Uh, we see two hands over here. And then Gil had a hand up too. Dean Cox, and the decision hasn't been made yet. Uh, the bonding capacity of the county is based on its total taxable value. Under state statute, the county's maximum uh, general obligation bonding limit is about $300 million, and that falls well short of what would be needed to build the Lake Powell pipeline. And so it's going to take the state of Utah and its bonding capability to actually determine whether or not this pipeline will eventually be built. It's, uh, it's beyond our grasp as a county to unilaterally make that decision. And so I think a lot of things are going to happen. I thought this was phenomenal information that has been presented. Uh, you remember the one slide with the graphic that showed St. George at the very bottom. We're having a hard time convinc convincing legislators and others in the metropolitan areas up north that they need to help subsidize our water when we're the lowest rates in the state. And so water rates are going to come up, and I don't think we'll see a pipeline uh, with help from the state of Utah until we get some parity on our rate structure. And so a lot of things have to happen, but in my opinion, the decision has not been made yet. Okay, we saw another hand, and then Gil had a hand up as well. <coughs> Grant Marsh. And I would like to know why the state of Utah would permit the loss of this value, the permanent loss of this valuable asset that it has within the state. Although the, the major use right now may be the, low, um, the lower portion of the state, but you, the state has a great deal involved, uh, asset value involved in this. Why is it not coming to the, uh, to the table also to save the asset? So I, I'm not understanding. I see some of you understand that question. Uh, Utah, this yeah. for clarification, Utah owns some water rights that they aren't using. It's about uh, 400,000 acre feet. The Lake Powell pipeline would, con would use 86,000 of that 400. He's saying, why would the state of Utah let the water rights go away and not help, so not help Washington County complete the project? Is that, that, that was the question you were asking and it hasn't been brought up, okay. Now tell me whether I'm wrong. Yeah. The state of Utah doesn't build the pipelines. Other entities have to build the pipelines. The state may help them fund it, That's, yeah, the but the fact is the other entities haven't done that much. And so they've come up to 86%, is it, or something like that? And uh, there's that much left that some other entities are going to have to do. And your entity is proposing doing it. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go to Gil. And then I just want to clarify one question. With the, Dean, you said that, I think you said there was a statute that we can't bond for more than X amount of the property value. But in that earlier slide that Richard showed where we bonded in 1983, 
30% of the assessed property value. So are you saying, is that the cap, or we're now smaller than that? Laws change, <laughs> and circumstances change. Uh, another interesting aspect where we're talking impact fees is Sorry. bond, people who buy bonds won't buy a bond that is financed by impact fees either. Just because if you have, uh, for any reason, people stop slowing, uh, moving in, and like we did with the Great Slowdown, the recession in 2008 and 2009, the bond buyers, they want to be paid. And, and they won't buy a bond if it's secured strictly by impact fees. And so that's another reason why we need the states participation. Okay, and that's why we can't, we're no longer viable to bond at 30% of the assessed property value because the law changed. Okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank Richard and, of course, uh, President Alder and Jennifer for putting this together and the comments that have been made. One of the interesting things in my life is I like movies. And quite frankly, we're in the middle of this movie. And some of us want the outcome to be X. Others might feel it's going to be why. I tend to be a very positive person, and as my wife will tell, as she elbows me in a movie, I'm saying, oh, that's going to be the person who's the villain, and that's going to be the one who's going to ride off in the sunset, and you know, everything's going to be rosy in my eyes because that's the outcome I want. I believe that in the true Dixie spirit, that's what's going to happen here. We're going to come together. We're going to learn to conserve. And as a landscaper for 35 years, I know right where we can do that, not create the heat islands, because there's lots of trees out there that drink a lot less water, but still provide shade and cool things. And there's other benefits to conservation as well. But I don't want a federal judge saying, Utah, you've had 90 years to use this water and you've not done anything about it. I'm going to give it to California. And, and I feel it's like Grant did up in the corner that we ought to make every effort to say, this is our asset and we're going to keep it. I look at it as food storage. I look at it as the future because 18% of our growth in this county is internal. People who have kids whose families want to stay here and own a house and live the American dream and not leave Dixie. I want to ask you two men because you're knowledgeable on this. I have a man in my neighborhood who for 17 years was the water master for St. George City. He's an old man like me. He says to me, there are at least 13 sources of water we have not tapped. And I say to him, because the state won't allow us to do it. There's no doubt there is more water here that we haven't fully developed. But also, federal regulations are impacting the water we do have. For example, a ridiculous amount of arsenic that we're supposed to take out of some of our wells that we draw from the west side. Arsenic levels lower than what occur in nature naturally. It's a ridiculous requirement and is forcing extra money be spent, and it may even shut down some of the wells. But we have to also know that underneath that nobody sees every day are hundreds of miles of pipeline that are part of a reuse system that from Bloomington, where the treatment plant is, is being pumped back into those pipelines and being used for golf courses and other entities, including this very university. So we have to be mindful that there are efforts being made to use of the 13 untapped, also one that is available to us in the fact that what we flush or put down a sink is actually being recaptured and used. Spence Reber told everybody many times in his life that there's quite a bit of water under Pine Valley, Rip Mountains, I believe that it's we true. haven't tapped. Okay, we've got certain we have to have, oh, okay, great. I see a hand over here, Doug. Who was it? Right over here. Okay. Just tell us your name, please. Uh, my name is Dan Thompson. Um, I'm just curious if you're familiar with the letter that the economics department from the University of Utah wrote um, on this subject. Um, I think their estimated cost was between 1.4 to 1.8 billion. And I'm just curious what your criticisms are of that or your analysis um, of their letter. So, um, Doug, did you have something or I know Richard I, does? I've read it okay. and uh, I'm familiar with it. They, they wrote it two times. They published a, a letter in 2012 and then almost an identical uh, you know, letter in 2015. Uh, the dollars in the, uh, that are quoted as cost are from a 2012 benefit cost ratio study that the Water District commissioned. In that, in that benefit cost study, 
the county water district, uh, conservancy district, looked at uh, an array, I want to say six, seven different scenarios. And what they did is they said, okay, we're going to spend X money now, but the operating costs for the different variations, pipeline alignments, whether we do the pump storage at the top of, of the hurricane cliffs, which costs more money, it's kind of like going in to buy a car. You're going to buy a car and there's a model that's a hybrid that costs 10,000 more, or you can buy the standard model that's not a hybrid. Hybrid's going to get better gas mileage, and you need to assess the insurance cost, the interest cost on at least the extra money that you spend, the, uh, the uh, operating costs, the gas that you put in the car, the uh, insurance, the taxes, and then you come together and you say, well, this alternative is better than that one. Well, they did that for six different variations. And because they brought future expenses forward to present value, that cost went up above the billion dollar base. So the billion dollar option was, I think, the lowest one at about 1 1.3 or 1 1.4 billion at, because they brought those costs forward. And the highest one was more. Again, it had the pump storage facilities cost more money in it and they, they bring more expenses that ca caused by the pump storage back, and they, but they were looking for better benefit cost awards. So the professors at Utah didn't identify those as the cost, the billion dollar cost. They took those scenarios with that future income stream as if that was the first time cost. Then they borrowed against it all at once. They said that Washington County is going to go out and get a loan for I think market rate 4%, and pay it back over 50 years. The actual Lake Powell pipeline is actually the state passed uh, an act, the Lake Powell Pipeline Act in 2006. And the state of Utah has committed that we're allowed, they'll act like a bank, charge us a below market interest rate, and that we can pay for the water as we take it. So we'll, and we'll take it in increments. And that will make our, our interest burden much less than they projected. Uh, they were informed by the district and by me personally, I wrote them a letter, professors, in 2012 when we got that letter, that that was the case. In 2015, they didn't revise anything. They, they made the same statements and just more of them signed it. I don't think it's a legitimate study. I think it doesn't, they didn't go to the facts that were available on either the cost side or the Lake Powell Pipeline Act. Had they done so, their second letter would have been revised and would have been quite different. So, you, you know, that's interesting. Now, uh, you, that's a good question, and I've heard that, that letter referred to many, in many different locations. So th there again, I'm thinking, okay, obviously, with a one-hour conversation, all we do sometimes is create more questions and raise more issues. So what I would say is that letter would be an interesting thing to analyze for its accuracy. You know, you're making some claims about the scholarship on it. I can post all the words, I put both yeah. the 2012 so and the 2015. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe do some analysis of it on the website, for on the Facebook page, for people who want to know how to evaluate that opinion by the university. I think we have maybe two or three minutes left. Questions. Yeah. Hi, my name's Mark Bull. I had a question. There was a recent court judgment on a Freedom of Information Act uh, request for, I believe, the financial model from uh, the Water District. The Water District said they didn't have any numbers, but the court said that they had a model for doing various things. The argument seemed to be here is what facts, what variables, what correlations, or whatever, and there doesn't seem to be a baseline. Everybody argues about different modeling, if you will, of what the cost of the pipeline is. What do you think, how do you think this conversation is going to change if that model is actually going to be brought out and become public? Well, let me, because I, I am on the SERPAC committee, which is an advisory committee about water issues in general. There's about 30 people. I'm the architect. I mean, I'm, that's why they got I brought, put on there. Uh, uh, Jeremy Aguero is a consultant from Las Vegas, a professor at UNLV, was hired to do this model. And the model, in fact, that he did is an Excel spreadsheet. And it has, it's a template and it allows you to put in your, your own assumptions, which we did in a big meeting 
30 of us so and Dick, raised our hands and put in. You're giving him a good detailed answer, but too much detail. But the little noise in my ear tells me I have about <laughs> 20 done. seconds left. So yeah. anyway, so, so he, yeah. he, it's sort of right that it's it was not one answer; it was an array of answers, and it's a mathematical template to fill in, and it's not filled in. I don't know that they, we went any farther than his. This is how it would work if you hire me to do more. I don't know that the district has retained him to do more. Yes, we need to get there. Right. And then right. you can kind of baseline where this conversation is going right. rather than everybody arguing over everybody's model. And, you know, let's have a model and then put the input. I think one of our frustrations is we have a really hard time finding facts mm -hmm. that we can trust. And, and I think people that are in charge of providing that information should maybe you know reconsider giving us a little bit more to work with that we we can have an intelligent conversation about it instead of doing a lot of guessing so i think we i think we are about out of time and so i i hope that you feel like this is a valuable thing to do to analyze the the complexity around it and to see what some of the challenges are around analyzing the decision making and, and looking at, at the assumptions we're making and and being thoughtful about it. <clears throat> I appreciate what Brooks said and other people that have spent a lot of time researching this topic and feel very strongly about the information they have being valid and and you know that you can make decisions based on. So what I'm really hoping is that this Facebook page that Doug Caputo is putting up for us will be a place where we can go and we can post questions. We can give each other feedback on some assumptions and some statistics and models and then ferret out the facts. So thank you very much for being here. And I want to thank the staff here at the Community Education Channel for being here to support us and for really for you being here as part of the community and participating. So thanks, and hopefully we'll have some more of these community conversations. Thank you. Yes, Doug? I want to say something after we turn yes. off. Oh, after we turn off. Okay. <laughs> All right, turn us off now so we can really let it rip. <laughs>